This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us today Rick Bellison in San Francisco, uh, who in addition to building a significant collection of Roman coins, uh, is one of the most genuine and generous people I've had the pleasure of knowing. Uh, in addition to serving the San Francisco Ancient Numismatic Society, he has regularly supported the preservation and study of numismatics, archaeology, and cultural heritage in this country and also abroad. Uh, so just a couple of examples I'll rattle off here. Uh, he has helped to fund a curatorial position at the British Museum that records all newly discovered coin hoards uh, in Britain, and he and other members of the San Francisco Ancient Numismatic Society uh, helped the St. Albans Museum purchase um, a locally discovered hoard of 150 late Roman gold coins, uh, which we now know as the, know as the Sandridge Hoard. Uh, he also recently donated funds to the York Museum to purchase another significant metal detector find, the Rydell Ritual Bronzes, which include a processional bust of Marcus Aurelius, and which is actually on display now at the York Museum if you happen to travel out there. Um, Rick Bellison is also an ANS Life Fellow, a great friend and benefactor to the ANS, and he was a trustee from 2010 to 2016. And in 2020, he was honored at the ANS Gala and received the Trustees Award for his distinguished service and support to the society. Uh, and of course, we are all very thankful here at the ANS for his uh, ongoing support and service. Uh, and the subject of his long table discussion today is coins in the Colosseum. And so with that, uh, take it away, Rick. Okay, let me do share screen and hopefully this will uh, work out. Um, so share screen. Um, This is always what I get nervous about. Um, bear with me. Screen. Why am I having trouble doing this? Let's see. Desktop one. Does everyone see that slide of the Coliseum? Yes, sir. Okay, so then uh, you can all see that, correct? Yes? Yes. Good. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let me just turn that off. Uh, Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in Zoom land. As you know from the introduction, I'm Richard Belson, but I'll go by Rick. And I first visited the ANS in 1964 when it was an Audubon Terrace. And I went to the ANS because I had some Roman coins that I wanted to have identified. And I've been collecting ancient Roman coins since 1964, I purchased my first coin in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul when it was legal to do so. And I've always been fascinated, not just by the coins, but their connection to Roman history. And that's one of my favorite topics. So today I'm going to discuss the Flavian Amphitheater, which is also known as the Colosseum in Roman Imperial Numismatics. And I wanna preface my remarks by saying, I'm a collector, I don't have scholarly academic credentials. So this is gonna be from a collector's perspective. I will talk about coin prices because collectors are interested in coin prices. And uh, for a deeper academic dive, I'd like to thank uh, two individuals, uh, Nathan Elkins, who is the incoming deputy director of the ANS. Nathan did his PhD thesis on uh, architectural representations on Roman coins, and he's written a wonderful book about the, the Colosseum. Uh, the other person I'd like to recognize is an archaeologist who lives in Rome. Her name is Livia Galante, and I crossed paths with her over the internet because she uh, works for a company called Context Travel slash Context Learning, and it's a travel company that, because of the pandemic, has been making its living 
by doing Zoom lectures. And she does all the lectures regarding uh, the archeological sites in Rome. She's absolutely fantastic. She's a delight to listen to, a wealth of knowledge. And uh, this is not a paid advertisement, but since I'm using some of her slides, I'd encourage people to go to the context travel or context learning website and see what seminar she's giving and consider signing up. You'll learn a lot. And uh, I actually attended her lecture on the Palatine Hill uh, earlier in the week. So uh, let's begin with this wonderful 19th century photograph. In the background, you have the uh, Flavian Amphitheater. In the foreground is a structure called the Meadow Sedans. It's a, a fountain. Unfortunately, it was demolished in 1936 by Mussolini. And to the right is the Arch of Constantine. Uh, in the first part of this presentation, I'm going to review all the coins and medallions I know that depict the Flavian Amphitheater. So, so here is the classic Colosseum Cistercius. Uh, the amp construction of the amphitheater began, began under the Emperor Vespasian, uh, but it was officially opened under the reign of his son, Titus. And here is the coin that was minted uh, to celebrate the opening of the amphitheater. This is an absolutely amazing example. And if you look at the obverse of the coin on the left, uh, there you see uh, the uh, amphitheater with all the spectators in the various levels. And you can see the beautiful decorations on the exterior, the arches, the entryway, uh, all the statuary. At the top, there's a row of decorative shields. To the left is that, that fountain we saw, the Meta Sudans, and to the right, the description is a portico building. And on the reverse, uh, you can see uh, the Emperor Tide is seated among captured arms, and we know that these are captured arms from putting down the rebellion in Judea. Okay, let's see. So what I just showed you is an absolutely spectacular example that with buyer's premiums went for half a million dollars. If, if you don't have that kind of money, what can you collect? Well, this is my uh, policy of Cistercius. I was thrilled to get it. Uh, in 1994 to C&G sale. And my acquisition price was around $4,000. So I think nowadays this would probably be a coin selling for between 10 and $30,000. I'm just thrilled to have it. But uh, as a collector, I think all collectors have the one that got away stories. So here's my the one that got away story. Here is another spectacular policy of Thurses of Titus. This one auctioned off in the NAC sale in 2009 uh, for over $200,000 and with the provenance of the William Conti collection. However, a decade earlier in 1999, it was in the land sale uh, as being from the Leo Benz collection where it sold for $25,000. Now, sometime between 1999 and 2009, I don't remember exactly when, but on a Sunday afternoon, I received a phone call from the dealer, Frank Kovacs. And he informed me that he had this coin for sale uh, and it could be mine for $50,000. Well, I was very tempted, but my collecting behavior is such that I usually don't upgrade once I have a coin. And also if you've purchased the coin for $4,000, there's a certain resistance to uh, paying $50,000 for the same coin type, even if it's in fabulous condition. So I declined to purchase the coin, but in retrospect, I regret that I didn't buy it. Uh, one, because I see it sold for $200,000 10 years later, although that's a moot point since all my coins are going into the pyramid with me. Um, but uh, it would be a lovely coin to have. When you can have a great coin in phenomenal condition, if you can afford it, go for it. Okay, so I didn't know this until I read Nathan's book, but there were actually two omissions of Colossi of the Thirsty. Uh, I always thought there was just one until I read the book, but it turns out that first coin you saw 
was minted under the reign of Titus, but he died shortly after he became emperor. He died in 81 AD. And then his younger brother, Domitian, became emperor. And he actually issued a coin with similar types, but this has a different reverse inscription and he is recognizing Divus Titus. So if you looked at the reverse inscription, it's very different. Uh, it's a Divo Tito, Divo Og T Divi F. But otherwise the coin types are the same. And this, in my opinion, is the most spectacular of all the existing examples. It's got a great provenance too. Uh, the naval sale of 1928. And then it was in this Dix Noonan Webb uh, Spectacular Auction, you know, property of an English gentleman. Uh, that was in 2017. And then it uh, changed hands again in 2020 with Numismatica Ars Classica. Once again, if you don't have a half a million dollars, what type of coin can you have in your collection? Uh, here's my example. Uh, this was uh, in the Park Hall McCulloch Collection auction by Stacks in 1967 where it went for the grand price of $300. I acquired it in 2019 in the Heritage Auction of the Morris Collection, uh, which is uh, the collection of Philip Peck. So I'm very thrilled to have this coin in my collection as well. So the amphitheater's construction began under Vespasian and continued under Titus and Domitian. Uh, if we fast forward to the early third century, uh, the Colosseum appears once again on Roman coins. Uh, the Emperor Severus Alexander had to uh, invest in infrastructure in uh, repairing the Colosseum, which has fallen into disrepair. So he made a major effort to get it repaired and reopened, and he issued these series of coins uh, to commemorate his efforts. So here is an absolutely spectacular aureus uh, depicting the Colosseum. Uh, this is a coin that actually came up for sale uh, in March of this year, and I had never seen one before, but this is a denarius of Severus Alexander depicting uh, the Colosseum. And uh, this coin uh, looks like it had been repaired, uh, but it still went for a pretty hefty price. And this is the example I have, uh, a Cistercius of Severus Alexander uh, that uh, depicts the Colosseum. So that was the Aureus, the Denarius, and the Cistercius under Severus Alexander. A few years later, under Gordian III, medallions were issued, probably in conjunction with uh, some games and celebration of his initial victories against the Parthians. So here is a Gordian III medallion. Uh, interesting on the price of this uh, medallion, it sold the hammer price of $87,000 in June of 2021 in an NAC sale. But uh, in CNG sale 2016, it sold for $30,000. And if you find this coin appealing to you, it's actually available for sale now. It's slabbed, it's been encased, and it's for sale on V coins through Minshall Trading Company for the grand price of $145,000. Um, anyway, uh, an inferior example actually sold this week in the Bertolani sale for about 11,000. Here is another medallion of Gordian III. I don't know anything about its commercial history. Uh, there's a gentleman named Blandor Ablazi who on Facebook puts all these pictures of amazing coins and medallions and he, he put this one on Facebook, so I included it in the presentation. But to my knowledge, these are all the coins and medallions that depict the Flavian Amphitheater. If anyone knows of any other, uh, please, during the Q&A, bring it to our attention. Uh, I'm now going to shift to the history behind the Flavian Amphitheater, but I'm actually going to begin with the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD. Uh, you know, the story is that Nero fiddled while Rome burned, but we know that this uh, story is not true. Nero was actually 35 miles away in Antium, which is present day Anzio, and he rushed back to Rome to supervise the putting out of the fire. Uh, however, after the fire, uh, human beings, human beings, uh, everyone wanted to blame someone, and, and Nero himself was one of the figures who uh, 
was a potential uh, to be blamed. He wanted to deflect the blame away from himself. And so he found a scapegoat. And the scapegoat were the Christians. Uh, they were blamed for the fire and they were rounded up and they were taken to this uh, structure, which is called the Circus of Caligula or the Circus of Nero. And this circus, it looks a lot like the Circus Maximus. This circus was uh, in an area across the Tiber called Vatican Hill. That's what it was called, Vatican Hill. And Agrippina had built a villa on Vatican Hill, which then led to Caligula building his circus for his entertainment on Vatican Hill. And then Nero inherited the circus. It became the Circus of Nero. And this is where the Christians were taken. They were tortured. They were crucified. They were made into human torches and lit up. And uh, there happened to be a necropolis on Vatican Hill, just north of the circus. So then uh, the bodies were entombed on Vatican Hill as well. And of course, the uh, St. Peter, Peter, who became St. Peter, was one of those martyred. Uh, he uh, did not feel he was worthy of being crucified as Jesus. So he insisted on being crucified upside down. And he was then taken and his, he was buried on Vatican Hill in a, what they call a poor man's tomb. But this tomb became a site of veneration for Christians. In the reign of Constantine, uh, the Emperor Constantine uh, decided to build a basilica on the site of Peter on, of St. Peter's tomb. And over the centuries, that basilica became grander and grander. Today, it is St. Peter's Basilica, also known as the Vatican. And the name Vatican comes from the fact that all this happened on the Vatican Hill. Now, in this aerial photograph of the uh, Vatican, uh, what you can see in red is the outline of where the Circus of Nero was. Uh, and in the middle, you can see a horizontal red line. That was the spina. And you see a yellow one. That's where the obelisk of the spina was. And that obelisk in 1536 was moved. And it's now in the Piazza San Pietro, where everyone visiting the Vatican can see it. And that is the remaining structure from the Circus of Nero or the Circus of Caligula. Okay, moving on with the history, uh, Nero became unpopular and eventually uh, Roman generals with the support of their troops revolted against Nero. And we ended up with what's called the year of the four emperors. Uh, during this year, uh, Nero uh, committed suicide and uh, the first uh, general to succeed him was Galba. He's in the upper left. Uh, eventually he was killed and replaced by Otho in the upper right. Uh, and then he was killed and he was replaced by Vitellius. That's in the lower right. But eventually the Roman general Vespasian who had been in charge of suppressing the rebellion in Judea, he marched uh, westward to Rome and his troops proclaimed him emperor. And he ended up being the ultimate victor in this year of the four emperors while his son Titus was left in Judea to quell the rebellion. So uh, Vespasian's family name was Flavian. And so the Flavians became the first non-Julio Claudians to become emperors. And Vespasian uh, wanted to have an, a dynasty. He, he loved his two sons. He felt they were both very capable. And so he wanted to introduce to the Roman people uh, the dynasty of the Flavians himself as emperor with potential successors, his sons, Titus and Domitian. And they embarked on a massive public relations campaign, including a building program to gain the goodwill of the Roman people and legitimize their rule. Uh, here are uh, the projects that they worked on. They rebuilt the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, which had been destroyed during the Battle of Vitellius. They finished the temple to deified Claudius. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today, uh, they dismantled parts of Nero's Grand Palace, his Domus Aurea, to build the Flavian Amphitheater. They rerouted the aqueducts that had fed the Domus Aurea for public use. 
Uh, there was this grand colossal statue of Nero. They replaced the head of Nero with the head of Sol. Uh, they established these various gladiatorial schools uh, to uh, prepare the gladiators to fight in the amphitheater. Uh, the Arch of Titus commemorating the victory over the Jews was built. That, stat that fountain, the Meta Sudans was built. The Baths of Titus were built, Vespasian's Temple of Peace and the Altar of Providence. So here is a coin uh, telling the Roman people that there's a new dynasty in town and its name is Flavian. Uh, this is Vespasian on the obverse of the Cistercius and on the reverse seated in togas are his two sons, Titus and Domitian. And here is a Cistercius where Vespasian is advertising that he has rebuilt the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. If, they, if you see this uh, pink background, uh, these are coins in my collection. And here is another fabulous Cistercius of Titus also uh, celebrating the reopening of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Uh, now this is a coin that was minted under the reign of Titus and both under the reigns of Titus and Domitian because as Flavians, they still wanted to kind of let the Roman people know that somehow they were associated with the good old days of the Julio-Claudians, they issued this series of restoration types. So this is a restoration type minted by Titus, uh, uh, basically replicating an as uh, with a Divus Augustus Pater obverse and an altar reverse that initially had been minted under the reign of Tiberius. And there's a whole series of these coins this particular coin came from the Sydenham collection, Reverend Sydenham, and was also uh, in the Dix Noonan web cell, which the spectacular uh, Colosseum Cistercius sold. Okay, so the construction of the Flavian Amphitheater commenced in 71 AD under the reign of Vespasian, and it was financed from the spoils of the Jewish war. How do we know that? because there's a dedicatory inscription that reads, and I'll just do the English, Emperor Caesar Vespasian Augustus ordered a new amphitheater to be made from the spoils. The spoils of what? It had to be the spoils of quelling the Jewish rebellion. And this dedicatory inscription was subsequently modified and a T was put after the Kais to include Titus. And when it opened, this is what that dedicatory inscription may have looked like. All right, so as I had mentioned, uh, one of the possible reasons why uh, Nero would have been blamed for the fire of Rome is he wanted these areas where there are previously homes and businesses, he wanted them to build his golden palace, uh, this spectacular palace complex. And how convenient that this fire ravaged Rome, or destroyed all these city blocks, and now that they were available to be expropriated by him. So uh, historians later uh, kind of pointed the finger at Nero and said, uh, maybe he started the fire so he could build his, his spectacular golden house palace. Anyway, uh, Vespasian, wanting to be a man of the people, decided that the golden house needed to be dismantled and it would be the perfect location for another type of palace, but this a palace of entertainment for the Roman people. And so where the lake was in the Domus Aureus is the location where he put the Flavian Amphitheater, as you can see in this map. And outlined on the map, you can see the where these other remnants of the Domus Aureus would be. And they found uh, the um, excavations uh, uh, of these remains. So uh, just to put things in geographic perspective, uh, the Flavian Amphitheater was very close to the Forum, as you can see from the left. And this aerial photograph shows where it is. It's uh, kind of in between this triangle of the Palatine Hill, the Capitoline Hill, and the, the Forum, and the Esquiline Hill, and, and a short walk from the Circus Maximus. Now, we talk about 
the Flavian Amphitheater and we call it the Colosseum. I, I suspect there's not a single tourist to Rome who even knows what the Flavian Amphitheater is. They know it as the Colosseum. Why is that? Well, as part of the Domus Aurea, uh, Nero had built this colossal statue of himself. And uh, this is a depiction of it. You can see the lake where the Colosseum was uh, ultimately situated. And there behind it is the palace and sticking out is the colossal statue of Nero. By the way, in this particular slide circled in red on the left, that is the rotating dining room. I took this slide from one of Olivia Galante's presentation. But there you can see the colossal statue. Now, when Vespasian became emperor, he changed the head so it no longer looked like Nero, it looked like Sol. Uh, then in 128 AD, uh, Hadrian wanted to build the Temple of Venus in Roma on the site where the colossal statue was. So he moved it uh, even closer to the Colosseum, to the Flavian Amphitheater. And then during the Middle Ages, because this colossal statue was right next to the amphitheater, it started getting referred to as the Colosseum. I was thinking of a, a modern day parallel in Rome. And you know, people like to go to the Spanish steppes. Uh, guess what? The Spanish steppes have nothing to do with Spanish. Uh, they were actually built by a Frenchman uh, or paid for by a Frenchman, um, as was the church. Uh, what happened was the Spanish embassy was very close by. So people started calling the, what should be the French steps, the Spanish steps. So likewise, instead of referring to the Flavian amphitheater as the Flavian amphitheater, because this colossal statue was nearby, people started calling it the Colosseum. And here's an aureus of Nero with the statue of Nero on the reverse. And it's just possible that this statue uh, is a depiction of the colossal statue of Nero. Uh, now, here's an aerial photograph uh, with the Flavian amphitheater to the left. And this is an important photo because in our minds, we basically just think of the Colosseum, but it was part of a vast complex of buildings which all were constructed to serve the spectacles that occurred in the Colosseum. And here's a list of the buildings. The Ludus Magnus, the great school where the gladiators were trained. The Ludus Dasicus for those who were trained to fight like Dacians. The Ludus Gallicus for those being trained to fight like the Gallic. Uh, the Ludus Matutinus to train the fighters to fight beasts. Uh, the Saniarum where the gladiators received medical care. The Spoliarum where the armor of the dead gladiators were taken off. The Armamentarium the arsenal for the gladiators, the Summum Chiragium, the staging place for all the shows, and the Castrum Nisanadium, which were the barracks for the sailors who worked the uh, valerian, the awning that could be uh, uh, put out or retracted to, to shade people from the sun. And these structures were all connected by tunnels so you could have this seamless, uh, servicing of the Colosseum to put on these spectacles. Now I'm gonna go into some of the vocabulary associated with the Flavian Amphitheater. And here I want to give uh, special credit to Nathan Elkins because uh, this vocabulary, I, I basically take it from his book. Uh, you know, prior to the Flavian Amphitheater, uh, the Romans had been wary of having permanent stone structures for entertainment. Uh, they had what were called spectacular, from which our word spectacular comes, uh, temporary wooden structures erected for games and festivals. Also, you know, in, if you go back to the Greeks, uh, they didn't have amphitheaters. They had theaters where you could see plays and show, shows and so forth, like the uh, theater of Dionysus on the Acropolis. In creating the amphitheater, what the Romans did, they took theatrum, a seeing place, an amphi. You can see it from both sides or all sides. So they combined two theaters and now they made an amphitheatrum, a place where one can see from all sides. Now the Flavian amphitheater was composed of travertine limestone blocks and it was covered in marble 
Uh, there were 80 numbered gates, uh, five elevated seating levels, and the exterior was decorated with statues and arches and elaborate shields adorned with the top level. And as I mentioned, they had this system of shading everyone, this valerian, kind of like a big ship sail that could be put out there or brought back in uh, on excessively hot and sunny days. So uh, here is some additional vocabulary associated with the amphitheater. The hypogeum is the substructure beneath the floor of the Colosseum where all the dirty work happens, all the preparatory work. The arena, that word the arena, it actually refers to just a sand covered floor. Uh, the caveat is the inner bowl. Uh, the pulvinar is the location uh, for statues and shrines to ancestors and gods. The valerium is this awning to shade people and the exits were called vomitorium. So here is an entrance. This is all, they're numbered. This is the entrance uh, gate 53. Very similar if you go to Madison Square Garden and you go in a particular entrance. Uh, here's the depiction of this awning, this valerium. And when the games were being uh, advertised, they'd advertise that there would be valerium, the shades. And here you can see this intricate rigging system, uh, very similar to a ship's rigging, which is why the crews manning the valerium uh, were from the Navy. Uh, here is a look at uh, the arena floor where you can look and see the hypogeum, which is what we as see as tourists today. Um, it's interesting to note that when the Colosseum initially opened, the hypogeum had not been installed and they had mock naval battles. But subsequently, under the Emperor Domitian, the hypogeum was installed and then they could do all the substructure work. Uh, preparing for the games. Here's a, a look at the seating. The capacity was estimated 50,000 plus. And just like today, the seating was determined by status. Uh, on the podium, they had the emperor and the senators and the priests. Uh, if they had rap singers in those days, that's probably where they sat with their bling. Um, first level was equestrians. The second level, plebeians wore togas. The third level, slaves, freedmen, and foreigners, and the fourth level, uh, the portico level, respectable women. We know a lot about the day at the games because Martial wrote the Book of Spectacles describing the games. And in the morning, they would held uh, beast spectacles with beasts fighting other beasts or special hunters fighting the beasts. Uh, midday, uh, executions, you know, you could have your Big Mac and watch an execution at lunchtime. And in the afternoon was the gladiatorial combat. And here's some of the vocabulary associated with the day at the games. The editor was the sponsor of the games, sometimes the emperor, sometimes a prominent citizen. The animal spectacles were called venatio. The human combatant in a hunt was a venator and a gladiator who fought beasts was a bestiaris. The public festivals themselves were called ludi. Uh, the swordsmen were the gladiators derived from the Roman word for sword, gladius. Uh, those who were executed were infamia, living in disgrace. There were various gladiator types and helmets. The most famous is the Mermillo helmet. And then of course, the other gladiator type that uh, we know from watching movies is the net man who did not have a shield and sword. And finally, everyone who's watched the movie knows about the polce verso, uh, turning the thumb up or down, should someone live or die. Uh, interesting historical note, in 404 AD, the Emperor Honorius ordered the end to gladiatorial fights in the Colosseum. So we have a lot of contemporary depictions of what happened in the Flavian Amphitheater. Uh, this is a, a depiction of a fight with a beast, with a venator. And you see circled in red, a circle with a black cross to it. Anytime you see one of those circles, it's not good news for the uh, animal or the human beneath that. It means they didn't make it. They did not live to see another day. This is a contorniate in my collection. And this shows one of these beast spectacles with a venator. Uh, there you can see on the reverse, the emperor with his entourage, and they're watching a venator confronting a wild beast. 
Uh, there are many mosaics depicting what happened in the uh, amphitheater. Here are some mosaics showing the midday uh, capital executions with the, uh, with the criminals being thrown to the wild beasts. Of course, uh, the main event were the gladiatorial combats and there were different types of gladiators. I talked about the different schools uh, for the different training, whether you're going to learn the Gallic style or the Dacian style. And these gladiators also wore different types of helmets and had different shields and swords and protective equipment, depending on their particular training and skill set. So here's a cartoon showing the various types. There's the Murmillo, the Secator, the Provocator. They all had large shields. The Equus, the Thrax, and the Hoplomachus had smaller shields. And then the Rotarius with the net man who didn't have a shield. Don't ask me the difference among them. <laughs> uh, here is a contemporary depiction of what went on. And uh, I want to make a very important point. The uh, public image of these uh, gladiatorial combats is that it, they were a fight to the death. That's why you had the thumbs up and thumbs down. That's actually not correct. Uh, the gladiators, for the most part, were slaves, and they represented investments. Uh, whoever owned the slaves invested a tremendous amount of money in procuring them, training them, and feeding them. And the last thing you want to do is have your investment uh, get killed. It's kind of like owning cryptocurrency this week. Um, you want your investment to continue to thrive and grow. So most gladiatorial combats were refereed and they did not result in death. Uh, the referee would stop the combat at some point and the gladiators would go on to live and fight another day. Now, eventually it was a dangerous occupation and eventually you just might end up getting killed, but that was the, the exception. And in this depiction here, you can see that uh, those little round circles with the line through it and Rodan did not make it, he got killed, and Astivus also got killed. But these others uh, did not get killed. Uh, here is a very famous painting I wanted to include it of the thumbs up, thumb down scene, the Pulce Verso. Uh, and when I researched it, I found out it wasn't in the Louvre or the British Museum or the Met. Uh, no disrespect to Phoenix, but it's in the Phoenix Art Museum. That kind of surprised me. Um, I'd love to go and see it someday. Now, aside from these uh, mosaics and frescoes and so forth, we know a lot about the equipment used by the gladiators because in the excavations of Pompeii, they found all these helmets and greaves and shields and so forth. And they're now on display, beautifully conserved, uh, either in Pompeii or in Naples. So you can go and see all this equipment. Uh, let's go back to the coinage. As I mentioned, the amphitheater was dedicated under the reign of Titus in 80 AD. There were 100 days of games were held in honor of the deified Vespasian, who with great foresight as he was dying said, I believe I'm becoming a god. And the dedication was accompanied by the issue of the Sesterci as well as smaller denomination coins, both under Titus and Domitian. And if you remember, the amphitheater was paid for with the spoils from the war. And when we look closer at uh, the Colosseum on the coin, you're going to see statuary relating to the Jewish rebellion. Uh, first, let's look at some small denominations. Here's a denarius of Titus depicting an elephant. And here is a quadrans of Domitian depicting a rhinoceros. So, we're going to return to my favorite Colosseum. This is the Divo Titus one that was uh, in the Dix Noon and Webb auction and the uh, spectacular obverse to look at. And I want to hone in on a part of the obverse. If you look here at this uh, column uh, of rows, the lower row, that's an arch for the entry. Above that, there's an arch with statuary. That statuary is of the emperor in the triumphal quadriga facing. Uh, the arch above that, there's more statuary, and that statuary is of a Judea Capta scene, as we'll see on the coins. 
And then the next level is a decorative shield. So here's uh, an amazing coin, a Cistercius uh, of Vespasian uh, celebrating his victory over the Jews. It says Judea Capta on the reverse, and it has the classic scene with the emperor to the left field, the palm tree indicative of Judea in the center, and the mourning seated Jewish in the right field. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of these coins issued. They're very popular with collectors. There are a lot of variations on this Judea captive theme with various captives and various poses. So if you look at this Cistercius, what happened to be minted and issued in 80 CE or 80 AD in conjunction with the opening of the Colosseum. Uh, you'll see the reverse of this one in the left field, it shows a standing Jewish captive with his hands held behind his back there. And then you have the palm tree. And then on the right side, you see the mourning Jewess. Well, I'm going to contend that that is the identical scene on this Colosseum. You have to use a little imagination and artistic license, but I think that character to the left that is the standing Jew with his arms tied behind his back. Then you clearly have the palm tree in the middle. And I believe to the right, it's the figure of the seated Jewish mourning. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Now, uh, in the statuary below the Judea Capta scene, there you have the emperor in a triumphal quadriga staring right at you. Uh, here is a classic Cistercius of Vespasian with the triumph emperor in the triumphal quadriga on the reverse. This is in profile. However, he also came out with an aureus uh, where the quadriga is a, a little bit in profile, a little bit facing you. And I think that that is what we're looking at. We're looking at the emperor in the triumphal quadriga right there. I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the reverse of the coin, which is uh, tied to seated among captured Jewish arms, simply to point out that this was not an original design. The coin to the right was minted by Claudius to celebrate his conquest of Britannia. And there's the emperor Claudius uh, seated among captured British arms. And it has to have been the inspiration for the reverse on the Colosseum Cistercius. Uh, once again, looking at the obverse in its totality, I want to focus on uh, the Meta Sudans, that fountain to the left. As far as I know, on Roman imperial coinage, this is the only depiction of the Meta Sudan. However, you know, collectors want coins with the Meta Sudans on it, and uh, foragers uh, and creative people are always willing to accommodate needs. Um, and we're going to look at, well, I'll show it here. This is a Cavino fantasy image of the Meta Sudans. Let me go back to this picture. Here is a photograph of the Meta Sudans. And unfortunately, in 1936, uh, Mussolini demolished it to make way for a traffic circle. Once again, here's that fantasy coin of the Meta Sudans. I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Colosseum after the fall of the Western Empire. Uh, it was ravaged by earthquakes. There was a particularly harsh earthquake in 847 AD, after which the structure was allowed to deteriorate. And you have to remember that after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, uh, the city of Rome itself became very depopulated, and it was down to you know tens of thousands of people, not hundreds of thousands or millions. So it became a pretty desolate place, and the Colosseum degenerated into an area of you know, ramshackle settlements and animal shelters. It had a little bit of a revival in the 12th century when part of it was used as a site for the Frangipani family palace. But then in 1349, there was a great earthquake that caused the collapse of its southern side. And of course, all during this period, it was used as a quarry. Anything of value in terms of metal clamps and marble was removed. And it's actually almost a miracle that it survived because it was a very easy source of building blocks if you wanted to build a church or a house or something. But it did survive in large part because the popes considered it to be the site of Christian martyrdom. Now we know that was fake news. I had told you earlier 
uh, St. Peter was crucified and the martyrdoms occurred uh, on the site of the Circus of Nero, St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, St. Paul was a Roman citizen. He was actually beheaded in private. But these stories that the Colosseum is where the Christians were fed to the lions persisted and the Pope believed it. In 1714, the Catholic Church actually erected 15 tabernacles for the Stations of the Cross along the edge of the arena. Then uh, in 1749, Pope Benedict XIV officially decreed that the Colosseum was a sacred place for the cult of the martyrs. And uh, subsequent popes ordered restorations of this very sacred place. In 1870, with the formation of the Italian state, the Colosseum became seen as a national historic monument, and obviously it became a huge tourist attraction. Uh, during the Mussolini regime, the hypogeum was excavated, and for, unfortunately, the destruction of the Meta Sudans occurred. And you know, the Italian government and the city of Rome continued to pour funds into restoring the Colosseum because it's such an important tourist attraction. Here are some contemporary uh, views of the Colosseum. Here's an etching done by Jan Gassart in 1509, clearly showing it wasn't in very good shape. Uh, this is a very famous print in 1776 by Giovanni Battista Piranesi. And in here, you can see these 15 tabernacles for the Stations of the Cross, which were erected in 1714. Here's a 19th century photograph showing the tabernacles and the Stations of the Cross and visitors are looking at them. Okay, so the Colosseum in Rome is a worldwide attraction, uh, probably one of the most famous tourist attractions, but it's not the only amphitheater. Uh, subsequently, wherever the Romans went, they built amphitheaters. And here is a map of the Roman world showing you wherever there's one of these red teardrops, uh, there is uh, the remains of an amphitheater. And sometimes they're incredibly well preserved. So here is the amphitheater in Verona. It's been uh, restored and it's used for concerts, probably a wonderful venue. Uh, another one in Pozzuoli, Italy, also used for concerts. Now the amphitheater in Pompeii has been fully uh, excavated uh, it's not repurposed for uh, entertainment purposes, but it's fascinating as a, a visitor to come and see it. This is amazing to me. This is in Luca, Italy. There was an amphitheater on this site, but now the cavia is occupied by homes and structures, and the arena is now an elliptical public space. And actually, if you go on Airbnb, you can find where you can stay in one of these uh, buildings. So that might be a fun thing to do. Uh, similar situation in the Poletia or Polenzo, Italy, where the outline of uh, the cavia is now filled with buildings and the arena is now a public space, a very green public space. It's not just in Italy. Here's the amphitheater in Arles, which is a popular outdoor entertainment venue and ditto in Nimes. And uh, maybe one of the best amphitheaters is in Pula, Croatia. It's not just Europe, if we go to North Africa, uh, here are the ruins of the amphitheater in El Gem, Tunisia, it was called Thrysis. And if it looks familiar, it's because it was in a Star Wars movie. And here's the amphitheater in Leptis Magna in Libya, which is where uh, the Emperor Septimius Severus came from. Now, I happen to love Roman Britain, I'm going to London. And in Londinium, there was an amphitheater, here is a map of uh, Londinium. And here is an aerial photograph of London today. You see where it says City of London. Right above the Y, there is a palish area. That is the plaza in front of the Guild Hall. And if you look at this palish area, the plaza in front of the Guild Hall, you'll see this elliptical ring. That's actually the outline of the arena. And you can go into these buildings and go downstairs and see the ruins of the amphitheater. And just recently in January, they discovered the ruins of an amphitheater in Switzerland, in Basel. So uh, if you're at all intrigued by everything I'm talking about, you can actually even construct and have 
an amphitheater in your house, you can go and buy a Lego Coliseum and it can be built in a day. I hope you've uh, found this presentation enjoyable and entertaining and informative. Uh, here I am in another amphitheater. This is in Carnuntum, Austria, where they've also found the gladiatorial school. Uh, in case you can't recognize me uh, in the left, there I am on the right. In the left, I'm wearing a, the classic Mormillo helmet and I'm holding a gladius. And uh, that is Bernard Wojtek, the expert on the coins of Trajan. He's a wonderful host if you're going to Vienna and Carnuntum. So once again, I'd like to give credit to Nathan Elkins. This is uh, his book, A Monument to Dynasty and Death. Uh, we gave it out in the goodie bag uh, at the gala where I was honored. And if you don't have it from that event, I strongly encourage you to get it and read it. It's a wonderful book. And on the right, that is Livia Galante from Context Learning slash Travel. And as I said, I encourage you to go to their website and see what lectures she's giving and sign up for them. And if you go to Rome, I'm sure she's a wonderful tour guide. So we'll say goodbye to the Colosseum and to Rome. And uh, this presentation is now officially over. I hope you will give me a thumbs up and uh, please exit through the vomitorium. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Rick, for that interesting talk and some really great slides in there. Uh, I, I, I lo <laughs> love the one with you and Bernhard there, that's great. Um, are there any questions uh, for Rick? Uh, you can unmute yourself if you have any questions. Then I've stopped sharing. Um, <clears throat> I can't find the um, raised hand. Uh, we can but hear you. Yeah. Um, but my 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 sort of comment was, uh, how about uh, have you um, uh, any experience of the um, of the amphitheater in Florence, Italy? Uh, I haven't been there. Uh, Nathan, do you have any commentary? I have not visited that one either. Well, uh, I I am uh, interested in it because um, uh, Roman. Uh, Florence sort of reappears in a um, uh, in a 15th century painting that I'm uh, working on. So, um, so I'm you. You can go um, when you think you're just uh, leaning against a curved wall uh, for a moment um, uh, in the street, one street in Florence. In point of fact, you're you know leaning against the am old amphitheater. Um, which you can, you know, from an aerial view, you can see um, uh, see quite well. So it, there isn't anything really to to visit, I don't think. So it's it, you know, it lacks that dimension. I see, I'm, I'm looking in the National Geographic history for this month. They have an article on the on Florence, but I don't see any references to the amphitheater. But I'm sure that uh, it's well outlined, or you can find it if you're there. We have any other yeah. questions for Rick? Yeah. Um, in the whole series of coins uh, celebrating the thousand years of Rome, there's, uh, I, I forget what emperor it was. But Philip. there is, a, huh? Yeah, Philip. There is a coin that shows all the games happening. They show it shows the ships for the fights and, and shows the gladiators on it, not the building itself, but all the things happening within it. It's in the bank, so I can't pull it out to show to anybody. But i'm thinking isn't that a coin of septimius severus that shows some of that or is it philip i i think it's philip but as i say it's in the bank i couldn't pull it out to find out for sure 
I think it's Septimia severus. Okay. I have a question, Rick. Um, your slide that showed, uh, it's not the Colosseum per se, but related. Uh, your slide that showed the, um, the Cistercius of Titus that had the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on it. Um, it looked like that, uh, that temple had other buildings next to it, which I don't think I've noticed before. Uh, um, do you know what was on that? Hold on. Um, let me see if I can find it. It almost looked like it had wings or something. Bear with me. Um, let me see if I can do the screen share again. Um, let's see, how do we get to that? Um, share screen. Um, can you use, everyone see that? Is that it there, Nathan? No, or it was the, the Titus one? one, the next oh, one. Oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, yeah, it looks like it's got wings on it. I don't think I've seen one like that before. Um, it's interesting. Is this, uh, do you know if this particular one has an RIC number or if it's a variant or anything? Uh, you know, I don't have it listed there. I have uh, the references to Numismatic Chronicle 179 and okay. uh, Wojtek number 12. Uh, he wrote an article about it. So I think in that article, he may address that issue, but I'll go back and look at the uh, Conquer 280, lot 554. I, I apologize if it had an RIC number, I should have it there and I don't. Oh, it's no problem. I, I'll look it up. I've, I've just never noticed that detail before. That's really interesting. So I'll have to have to check that out. Thanks for showing that. Yeah, but it does look like, yeah, separate buildings to the left and the right in the foreground and that temple is in the background. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Any other any other questions or comments for Rick? I'm seeing thumbs up. Good. I Better like thumbs, thumbs up. Down, yeah. <laughs> Although some say in the antiquity, of course, thumbs up was, you know, the death sign. So maybe we've got it backwards. Looks like somebody was about to say something. Sorry. Joni. Uh, I, I was just wondering if there are other um uh, uh other um uh, buildings uh that have the same kind of uh history of um being featured on coins uh could you repeat your question please uh, i'm just wondering um i've never thought about this question before and i'm sort of fascinated and wonder if whether or not there are other uh roman buildings or constructions that receive the same attention. Well, that's what Nathan's PhD thesis is on, and that can uh, actually it, it turned into a public a book of the American Numismatic Society. So, if you're asking this question to this audience, uh, you've got the right person with Nathan to answer the question. Yeah, there Nathan. were there were a lot of good Roman buildings that were shown uh, off and on through the centu centuries, the Temple of Venus in Roma, the Circus Maximus, um, the Temple of Jupiter, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so the Romans, in fact, were um, really the, the first um, civilization to regularly depict the built environment on their coins. By the way, Warren Esty, I'm going to go to screen share again if I can, because Warren posted the link to uh, the coin showing uh, Septimius Severus, uh, the scene from Septimius Severus. And can everyone see that gold aureus? Yes? No? Maybe? Can you see it? Yeah, can we get a verbal see confirmation? It. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, the, here's the coin that uh, Warren sent the link to, and maybe this is the coin that you were referring to that shows uh, the various uh, ship and the various participants in um, uh, 
uh, these activities. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.